So welcome back to our discussion of the book Agile Principles for Business by James S. Wright. Uh, it's available on Amazon as well as Kindle and Audible. I'm once again joined by James, and uh, we'll be delving into some questions from Chapter 5. So right off the bat, um, one of the things that you said was that this stuff works everywhere. So do you have any stories uh, that maybe aren't in the book that kind of illustrate that point? Yeah, I'm, I'm guessing most people who read the book thought James has used all of his stories because there are a lot of them in there. Uh, but just last week, I was thinking um, about something that happened when I was uh, right out of college. Uh, my first job, I was at a software company called Codalent, and uh, my degree was in economics, but they hired me to be a product manager for their custom software. Uh, the company made job costing and job management software for printing and pre-print companies. Um, and so it was basically just a big accounting system with some estimating and things like that. Well, they wouldn't sell this stuff. It's pretty expensive. And uh, you know, some customers wanted custom reports or custom whatever. And I was the product manager for the custom products. So we had 13 engineers. They stuck us over in the armpit of the building. And uh, I designed the software and then we dished it out to the engineers to write it, and then we shipped it off to the customers. But when I got there in August, um, the group had lost a ton of money uh, from January to August. And they hired me to manage things a little bit better um, with the idea that I could get the design done quicker because it'd be a dedicated person instead of having the software guys design it and build it. Um, they were hoping to cut some of their losses. Well, I got there and I started doing it. I designed the software, we dished it out to the engineers. And I thought, you know, uh, we could do a lot better at this. And right? so just losing money better, we should try to make some money. We are charging the customers for the software in many cases. So I just did some really simple prioritization. And said, first of all, well, which things are more important than the others? You know, some customers are more important. Sometimes they have a request that's a must have and sometimes the requests are nice to have. Um, and then I did a lot more planning. Instead of just designing the stuff and throwing it over to the guys, I looked at the stuff and I said, hey, this is kind of like this one over here. So why don't we design something that takes care of both and just do one instead of do two? And then I looked in our library and I tried to find stuff that we had done previously that would fill the needs of future customers. So we didn't have to do anything at all. We could just, you know, load it up and test it and then ship it out. Well, I mean, it wasn't much work. You know, they hired me just to do the one thing. And with the time I was in the office, able to do the rest of the stuff. Well, from August until December, we made it for all the losses for previous in the year. And then we turned a really nice profit. So we ended up being, went from being the worst performing group in the company to being the second best performing group in the company in just four months. Um, and it was really basic, just a little bit of planning, a little bit of prioritization. Nobody asked me to do it, uh, but that stuff works. And this was on a standard kind of waterfallish uh, company back in 1989. Um, and uh, yeah, there you go. Nice. Um, so from, from that work, uh, did you have any, any specific learnings or, or um, ideas? How did that, how did that play into, um, how did that experience play into what you wrote in the, in the book? Well, I actually completely forgot about it. Um, I said, I just thought about it last week. Um, I was trying to think of what if somebody asked me a question about some of the stuff that I've done that isn't in the book. I need to think of some additional stuff. And then I, okay, well, what didn't I talk about? Um, and uh, again, the point is just that this stuff works. Even if you don't adopt Agile in a big way, just try to use the principles that are in the book more. Yeah. And you'll get some benefit. So speaking of the principles, um, the uh, well, 
first, let's go back just a little bit because there was something I think that was uh, significant to understand. I don't want to say the same word over and over again, uh, but why is it necessary to be able to differentiate between something that is urgent and something that is important? All right, well, I think it's had some popularity about 15 years ago, but um, kind of your, your question is the answer. Mm -hmm. Important stuff's important. <laughs> Urgent stuff might be important, uh, but it might not be. Um, and we should be doing the most important things next at all times. And not just so, the urgent stuff. So if it's urgent but not important, that loses to things that are important but not urgent. Well, yeah, we can get into a lot of semantics here, but let me break it down really fast, right? How does something that's not important become, become urgent because somebody didn't plan properly? If something is important but not urgent, that just means it's something that we put in the backlog to do at the appropriate time, right? It's, we don't need to get into too many details about, you know, this adjective versus that adjective. But the main thing is that we need to make sure that we don't get in a situation where we make things become urgent artificially. Yeah. It's always best to do the important things at the appropriate time, um, hopefully before they become urgent, right? You, you don't wanna be working in an urgent mode. Uh, you know, you've been in, you've been in work where you have your, your normal uh, routine and then you have something maybe called a fire drill or you know, all hands on deck or whatever it might be. You want to avoid those kind of situations. Yeah. So if you do the important things at the right time based upon your planning, um, then you're going to be much better off. Um, and you definitely want to avoid urgent stuff that doesn't need to be done. And again, that's yeah. just those are mistakes. Uh, learn from your mistakes. Yeah, that's uh, that's something I try to address a lot with uh, the teams that I work with because despite the shirt that I'm wearing, I don't think it's a very good idea to have superheroes on the team that have to swoop in at the last moment and save the sprint or complete work in a timely manner. I think that um, we should probably push back if we're getting if we're getting those kinds of things frequently, they should be pushed back on so that we can say, look, you're gonna have to you're gonna have to determine whether these things are the most important or tell us, you know, how do we go about fixing fixing the the decision making process so that we don't always have you know, critical items coming in at the very last minute. If that's what we have to deal with, then maybe we should take the product in a different direction, or maybe there's maybe there's some other um, situation that needs to be addressed at the root of this that's got us working on this set of features over here that aren't necessarily, um, you know, urgent. And then all of a sudden, every single sprint, we've got, Oh, we've got to complete this other 15 points worth of work. We've got you know four or five different stories that come in and they have to be done. I have a team right now that every single sprint, they only plan half the sprint because they know that every single sprint, an additional 20 points of work is going to come in. <laughs> All right. Well, so you know my my advice on that, right? If you have a if you have a situation, we have a team that has to react to unexpected work, then you should time box that and use the Kanban method to manage that. And then use the scrum method or whatever other thing you're using to manage the planned work. And you can manage that okay. But those are for teams that are designed to be that way. Um, you don't want a team that's designed to be a scrummy team to be dealing with ad hoc requests. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we live in a imperfect world and we can expect things to go on, you know, unexpectedly. Um, and we can, uh, you know, we must deal with it to a certain extent. But if you remember the story I talked about with the vice president of marketing, that was a client of mine, you have to learn how to say no and deal with pain 
of saying no for you ever to improve your prognostication capabilities or to know where to make improvements in your product or in your processes so that you don't have this recurring, you know, urgent problem happening on an ongoing basis. Yep. As long as you keep saying yes, then things will never change. That's right. <laughs> um, okay. So, uh, Earlier, we were talking a little bit about uh, we kind of dipped our toe into that whole discussion around facts, policies, and principles. Um, so what can you tell me? What's the connection between facts, policies, and principles, and why Why do we care? All right. So I'm going to start off and say this. I don't know that there's any other book on Agile that talks about this topic. And I'm going to say that this is the most important topic in Agile. Mm-hmm how to make decisions. We're going to be taking in an agile environment, we're gonna take decisions, we're gonna push them out as far as we can so that they're as close to the customer, as close to the problem as possible so they can happen quickly by the people who know the most. And we call this our, our taxi situation or our pilot situation, right? Well, if we're gonna have people all across our company making decisions, we need to teach them how to make decisions. Um, and that's where if you're going to make correct decisions, you have to understand what a fact is, what a, or sometimes I call a doctrine, what a principle is, and uh, what the policies are. Now, in military, doctrine means something else. That means a concept of what you do in a certain circumstance. That's actually a rule of the road that we talk about in the next chapter. Mm -hmm. But <clears throat> you have to know what's real and not real. Those are the facts. The principles are based upon those. Facts don't really give you much of a decision-making capability. They say things like... Uh, Water is uh, wet, sky yeah. is blue. <laughs> Code with errors and it don't work. Uh, <laughs> customers that are unhappy won't buy the next thing. Stuff like that. Yeah. That doesn't tell you really what to do, but principles are based upon the facts, on these doctrines. And they give you some idea about action. Um, for example, communication. We need to communicate with each other. We need to be transparent and show each other our stuff to try and save time, right? Um, the principles are the power. And I would say that if you're going to buy my book and you only want to read one chapter, this is the one chapter, mm -hmm. right? If you know what principles are, then you can start making decisions. And policies are just the rules we make to help make routine decisions faster. Um, Scrum is a set of policies. Kanban is a set of policies. SAFE is a big set of policies. Uh, they're just there to help you make decisions on an ongoing basis, right? So I think one of the, one of the when I teach a class, I always ask this question. A lot of companies have a policy that says you need to have two people sign a check, right? I don't know, maybe today people do wire transfers and nobody cares about checks anymore. But, um, and maybe, maybe if I do in this class for millennials, I don't even know what I'm talking about. But, uh, so I, I say, what, why do we have two people sign the check? And, you know, eventually somebody will raise the, the idea. Well, well, if we have two people send the check, then it, it eliminates the ability for one person to cheat the company. Yeah. And I said, well, what if the two people work in the same department? Does that, is that a good one? And then we get into a discussion. About, well, maybe it should be someone that's in charge of writing checks and someone from the controller's office, right? So you have an outside person looking in. It can't be two people working together. Like a long time ago, I, I ran checks for a company when I was, in, when I was in, like a part-time job in college. And what if one of the signatures was me? Well, that would have been a really bad idea. Well, I'm honest. But <laughs> if they made me one of the second people, I'm the guy that ran the checks through the machine. And so if I was able to approve the checks, I could like pay a whole bunch of people that are buddies of mine, right? Anyway, so the, if you know the policy but you don't know why you have the policy, that doesn't help you make decisions very well, right? Well, the principle is you wanna have oversight to avoid um, fraud or big mistakes. Well, that's the principle. So if you understand the principle that can help you make other decisions to avoid fraud and big mistakes. 
right? Well, what happens when you're not running checks anymore? You're doing EFTs. Well, EFTs don't have signatures on them. The principle is still there. You want to avoid the fraud and the big mistakes. So if you understand the principle, now you know how to put into place the next, the next policy. But if you don't understand the principles, you're going to end up with, you know, somebody sending a bunch of money to his you know, cousin. Yeah. <laughs> when I was in the military, that we called anytime you had two people that had to, you know, that were required for something, we called that TPI, the two person integrity, because it's less likely that two people will, you know, coordinate on a lie than one person if left to their own devices. Yeah, and so that's a principle, right? Mm -hmm. So that based upon that principle, what other decisions should you make, right? If you understand the principles, it will help you make better decisions. And again, we talked about it earlier. If you teach correct principles to people, they can manage themselves, and then all you need to do is lead. Yep. But you need to teach them how to use the principles to make the decisions. And again, that's why this chapter is so important because yeah. – um, the alternative to having people make the decisions themselves is to micromanage them. And that's the opposite of agile. So in, in the, in your experience, um, do you have stories or do you frequently see uh, decisions being made some other way besides um, principle-based decision-making? Well, there's the, the way we've always done it. You know, there's a great, um, Grace Hopper quote in the book that says, if she could, she would haunt you from the grave to stop you from ever saying that. Um, there's the decision based upon tradition from what other companies do. There's the what's easiest. There's a whole lot of ways to make decisions. Um, uh, I got a lot of stories about really bad decisions that managers of mine have made over the years. Uh, I don't know if it's worth diving into their strangeness, um, but I will tell you that if you don't base those decisions and principles, the odds are you're going to make a mistake. You can you can be evil and bad and still make good decisions. I mean, bad in terms of poor decision making capability, um, but if you if you base your decisions on principles, then you're you're going to be much better. And if you make a mistake, now you have the basis to learn from the mistake to get better. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's much easier whenever you base your decisions on the principles. Uh, it's much easier to to swallow that pride and say, ah, well, I. I made the wrong decision here, but I know that the principle is still true. It doesn't matter that I made the wrong decision on yeah, this if, one occasion. I just need to learn from it. Yeah, there, the, you go back to my stats class, right? So my intro to stats class, I meant. Not the advanced one. Uh, I don't know if I can remember anything from that. Um, there's a type one and a type two error. Type one error is making the decision based upon uh, principles and misunderstanding the principles, mm -hmm. right? That's one kind of error. The other error is making the principle, making a principle-based decision, but applying them incorrectly, right? Regardless what mistake you have, you can learn from it mm -hmm. if you start off with trying to do the right thing. Yeah. And I would argue that in a business environment or any kind of organization, if your people make a mistake where they attempted to make the decisions based upon principles, you should not get angry or upset. You should turn it into a learning moment. That's like, one of the interesting things that I've seen recently with a lot of businesses, uh, you know, larger businesses that are there that are adopting agile ways of doing things is they actually reward people for discovering um failures right that if like the there's a story the famous story about uh somebody who uh brought down aws like single-handedly i don't i don't remember exactly how it happened they but they uh pushed the wrong line of code to production and it disabled everything for all the customers at the same time and then they instead of firing the guy they said 
thanks for discovering this critical vulnerability. You know, here's a bonus and, you know, let's figure out how to fix it. Yeah. One line of code shouldn't take down anything. <laughs> um, yeah. When I, when I, when I coach teams, I tell them very specifically that they should say the bad news as loudly as the good news. I mean, I, you probably heard me say that a hundred times. Yeah. Um, but I also tell them that when they start talking about what happened in their sprint, anything that they learned new, that's what they should say first. Mm -hmm. We thought it was like this, but it turned out to be like that. We thought this would work. It didn't. And so we're trying to find a solution to it. They should always start with that first because that's the kind of stuff other people need to hear. Yeah. And it's better that that mistake happened in one team and it's learned everywhere else than everybody has to learn that mistake on their own, right? I remember when I was uh, 12, I don't think this is in the book, um, someone told me the, that uh, a wise man learns from his mistake, but a wiser man learns from other people's mistakes. Similar to the Jack Handy quote, you know, it takes a big man to cry, but it takes a bigger man to laugh at that man. <laughs> All right. Um, let's see. So why do, so based on the discussion that we're that we're having, I think it's probably self-evident, but you tell people frequently to abandon their principle abandon their policies <laughs> first. <laughs> Abandon yeah. their policies first, and stick to the principles. So why why do you uh, why do you advocate for that? Policies are artificial abstract. They they were created uh, by definition. They can't last forever. Yeah. If you can create something, it can die. Principles can't be created, so by definition, they can't die. Um, and. Um, if you're trying to do the right thing and the policy gets in the way, what's your excuse? Sorry, customer, I couldn't take care of you, but I have a policy that says I can't. Is the customer going to be happy with that? Not no. at all. Sorry, boss, I tried to improve profitability, but with the policies in place, I just couldn't do that. Is he going to say, oh, that's all fine. This is your bonus. Go away. You know, go, go off and I'll see you tomorrow. No, he's going to say, well, then why didn't we change things? Um, there is as I say many, many times, right? There is not a scrum police. Uh, in many companies, there is a policy police, right? Mm -hmm. um, we need to get away from that. Um, you know, I, I one of the, the, this thing I brag about most in my coaching career is uh, the work I did at Cisco one summer, where we, you know, we generated a billion dollars of incremental revenue. Well, how did we do that? We broke a ton of policies. <laughs> we we wanted to make a change to the homepage. The people in charge of the homepage said, you can't do that. So we went to the vice president and said, please tell them we can do that. And then he <laughs> told them, and then we did it. And we did it two or three times. And I think one or two of those times it didn't work well, but one of those times it made a big impact and, and it was great. And then we tried to do something with the webinars. Well, they said, well, you can't do that. And he said, well, we're gonna do it anyways. Um, we, we generated all of that change because, well, because we did things differently. And when we did things differently, we broke a lot of rules. Sometimes we got permission ahead of time. Sometimes we said, I'm sorry afterwards, but we, I'm sorry, but we generated a whole bunch of money. Is it okay? <laughs> you know, yeah. if, if you live in a, and if you live in a highly regulated environment, that any kind of change is going to cause policy breaking, and you know we're all about change and transfer and transformation, right? So we're going to have to change some things. If you're if you're adopting agile, you're changing policy by definition. You're changing. You're going to change all of those waterfall policies. Yeah, the, it's like uh, when I was a kid, I remember reading some uh, some books by a Navy SEAL named Richard Marcinko, and he always talked about. Um, his policy of decision making was called UNODIR, U N O D I R, and it stood for unless otherwise directed. And that was how he got around all of the stupid policies that the Navy had 
around the way that the Navy SEALs were going to operate, the way his team specifically was going to operate in any given situation. He would just say, unless otherwise directed, I'm going to do it this way. And he would, you know, generate a form or generate whatever the, uh-huh. the report was, send it up. And most of the time, people never looked at those things. They just rubber stamped them. And so <laughs> they would they would sign off on the things that he wanted to do and then come back and say, we're going to nail you for this. And he'd say, you signed off on it. <laughs> well, if you recall, how did the paratroopers do so well in D-Day? Because they created whole new ways of doing things. Yep. You know, how did I Omega do well? Because they killed their policy of being on the treadmill and come out with the next highest, uh, uh, next highest capacity and, you know, high price. They changed their policy to, you know, lowest price poli- possible with, uh, you know, good enough storage. Very, very different policy. You know, they went from 150 million in revenue to 1.7 billion in two years. You, if you want to improve things, you got to make changes, which means you got to break policy. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's well said. Uh, so I'll tell you one more story. All right, this is. This is a uh, again one I haven't. This is one I haven't told in a long time. Um, when I was 12 years old, I went on a 50 mile camping trip with my uh, Boy Scout friends, and we went to the top of Mount Whitney, the tallest mountain in the continental United States, and uh, you know Kings Canyon National Park. And it's kind of a harsh environment. And one night, um, I got altitude sickness pretty bad. I was a 12 year old kid, and I was really skinny, and uh, we were at 13,000 feet, and my body didn't like it so much. I threw up all my food. No. You know, I was terrible. Well, that night there was a storm in the valley. It formed. It came up on top of us and rained on us all night. And my tent fly didn't work. So my brother woke me up in the middle of the night. My head was in a puddle. My sleeping bag was completely wet. Now my scout master, um, brilliant man, he was uh, my dentist. Um, he, you know, three o'clock in the morning, whenever it was, and he put his hand on my forehead and realized I had hypothermia, right? Mm -hmm. I I could have died. So there's this really, really, really important policy in Boy Scouts that says you got to have two adults and that no adult should be alone with anybody. And the really, really big policy that says no scout master and scout should be in the same sleeping bag, right? You could be kicked out a scout, you could be prosecuted, but he put me in a sleeping bag to make sure I didn't die. Mm-hmm. I am really, really happy he broke that policy. It's like the biggest policy Boy Scouts have, and I'm really glad he broke it. Because there's a principle that says, having a boy die on a trip is really bad. <laughs> it's For like the family really and bad, everything man. else. Yeah. <laughs> That that's the that principle is overwrite overrode everything else. So, you know, I'm not telling you should go out there and willy-nilly do whatever you right. want, but if the principle is in conflict with the policy, the principle matters more. Yep. Yep, well said. Uh so one of the fun things that I pulled out of this chapter was the uh the innovation box challenge from the the PMI chart you were talking about what what is your innovation box challenge do you want to talk about that yeah so i i pull up a a standard fancy color-coded project plan you know really big pert chart really pretty with little bubbles and everything and i say to anybody okay now it doesn't matter if you have prior warning you're still not going to win I say, I got $50 for anyone who can tell me, where does it say on this chart to innovate? Where does it say on this chart to reevaluate whether we should be really doing this project or not? And of course there isn't. There's just this urgency of moving from this box to this box. And if you go to our weekly project meeting, they're gonna say, can I put a red or can I put a green as our status? Or does it have to be yellow or red, right? And all they care about is making sure they don't have any yellows or red. But they don't care about, are we doing the right thing? Mm-hmm. Um, and that's kind of the, the basic concept of the, once you put a waterfall plan in place, now you've made everything urgent. 
where the most important thing might be kill the whole thing. But I'll tell you, there's no product manager I know of that would ever, would ever go out into a meeting and say, I think we should kill the whole thing. Because <laughs> uh, he's, he's, he's incentivized to finish it on time or early or under budget or whatever. I don't know of an incentive out there of killing something halfway through because you learned something new. Yeah. That's the way it should be if that's the right thing to do. It should be, but often, <laughs> most of the time, it's not. Uh, I don't think I've ever, I don't think I've ever seen anyone even challenge the the need for a project. Maybe other than me, <laughs> I always ask the question: You know, what happens if we don't do this whole entire project? Does anything bad happen? Well, I I have a rule when I coach. It goes like this. If I ask you to do something and you ask me why, if I can't answer the question, you don't have to do it. Yeah. That should be the rule for everything. <laughs> right? We're, we're not children where we can't, like when my child says, do I have to clean my room? And I say yes. And they ask why I say something like, because I'm the parent. Well, there's actually a really good reason for it. I just don't have the time to sit down and explain it to a three-year-old. or Maybe their ability to understand might not be there. But as an adult, you should be willing, you should be able to ask why, as long as you don't say it with a whiny voice. Um, and if there isn't an answer, why should you do it? If there isn't an answer, it must not be important. Um, yeah. And that's that's kind of the, the, the thing, right? If it's not important, why do it? Yeah, but it goes back. But I would say if your boss is telling you something that is important, it's because he has that on his list of things, how he gets bonused or evaluated. Mm -hmm. It all goes back to bad systems, which are policies. Right. The principle should be you incentivize your employees to do the right thing, not to follow a system. All right. Was there anything else that you wanted to address from this chapter? I think the I think the important points we got across already. It's not a very long chapter, like you said. It is the most important chapter in the book because of the fact that it talks about the principle based decision decision making and and how you can achieve that within the organization. But is there anything else that you wanted to call out specifically from this chapter? Yeah, so I'll do two things. The first thing is, I really like that Bain study that I quote in there that says that most reorganizations lose money. And I think we've all seen that in our lives. You ask, why did they do that? And if you can't answer it, maybe it's bad, right? Um, but the point they say is that the only reorganizations that worked are reorganizations that allowed decisions to be made at the periphery of the company. Now, if you don't teach people how to make decisions, those decisions are probably going to be bad. Uh, but the whole point here is that um, for people to make the right decisions, they know how to work with principles, but they also need to know what the strategy is. You have to have, have a strategy from the top that makes sense. You have to have defined objectives. Um, and that's why we have the next chapters that happen next, right? We have actually the next chapters on how to set some policies. Um, and that's cool. Those are called rules of the road. Uh, but then we get into the, why do we have to have a, a product strategy? And why do we have to have a company strategy? How do you build a company strategy based upon the way that you look at your customers? And then how do we do that transformation to implement that strategy? And then how do we bring in the right people to run that? So, there's like 150 pages following this chapter, all based upon the concept of, we want people to make the decisions. They have to know the, the principles that apply. And one of the principles is that you wanted to make the decisions to help the company's goals come to pass, right? Well, then you have to create all those goals. So uh, again, if you're only gonna read one chapter, this is the chapter to read. And it's the, this chapter here is the cause for the rest of the book. Um, strangely, Again, I don't think these topics are in other Agile books, and uh, it's a shame. Uh, the last thing I'll say is um, 
I kind of rip on an entire genre of books. In that chapter, I think I say something like, every book written on time management is wrong. Um, <laughs> I'll stick with that. <laughs> I, I, I do think they're wrong. Because anything that tells you how to run your life uh, makes a whole lot of assumptions that they don't know about you and your life. Um, but it, it, all you have to do is read chapter five. Understand the principles that affect your life. Practice making decisions on those, and you can make some good decisions. Learn from your mistakes, and you'll get better. Yep. Awesome. Well, thanks, James. Appreciate that. Uh, what should we look forward to? Well, you already kind of talked a little bit about uh, chapter six. But uh, is there anything that you wanted to call out about chapter six that, that we should look forward to? Well, chapter six is is very short. Um, it has some like uh, what we would call obvious things in it. Um, some things that are built into agile coaching things like uh, operating uh, uh, agreements um, that coaches love to put in place for teams. Um, but then some other things like some very specific um rules from some businesses that are you know very specific to them the point of the book is of that chapter is um you know if you're going to send your people out in the world to make decisions for themselves you know give them some guidelines um you know each company has its own culture and has its own personality they want to propagate um this is your chance to lay those things out all right for example Way back in the beginning, Google had an idea that they weren't going to be evil. And then 10 years later, when they got rich, they decided to take that away from one of their rules. Uh, and now maybe they're all evil. Uh, but my point is that you it's your company, it's your team, it's your group. Um, you should set up who, you know, have some guidelines about what things are acceptable and not acceptable. And, you know, some things that you've learned over time that work for your group, uh, you know, makes it what... You know, for example, what's the definition of done? That's a really, really niche, agile topic, um, but it's probably different in every group. All right. Um, and in some companies like that, my favorite little rule is from John Huntsman. We talked about um, how to make a decision on the uh, financial uh, decision to buy a factory or not. Well, that probably doesn't apply to you and your job, but I just, I just like the way that that's a guideline they had. Yeah. And it's not obvious. And a lot of the rules of the road that you'll set up are kind of non-obvious. But, you know, if you've learned it through experience, don't make the same mistake twice or three times. You know, learn from what goes wrong. But again, the principles are more important. And be prepared if, if you find a situation where your guideline doesn't match your principles. Now you have the tools to know when to change your policy. All right. Well, thanks, James. Appreciate. Oh, and we'll talk, and we'll talk about that next week. So I just thought of one of the great examples, but uh, we'll talk about that next week. All right, sounds good. We'll look forward to talking again after chapter six. Thanks. All right. Bye.